uh, on the screen, we have Avi Seufer, uh, we have Chuck Crumpton, uh, we have uh, uh, retired Judge Walter Kiramitsu, and we're going to talk about the, the status of the Supreme Court, and I guess we're going to spring off Linda Greenhouse's article about the fragmentation in that Louisiana case. Uh, but uh, Avi, can you, can you tell us roughly what the parameters of this discussion are? Well, the Supreme Court has done surprising things many times, but what uh, Linda Greenhouse has developed with great uh, clarity, I think, she writes every other week a column in the New York Times and used to cover the Supreme Court for many years. She really knows the inside story. And she has an article uh, two weeks before that's called The Supreme Court Fails Us. And I think uh, it's not the first time, but it is pretty blatant that the Supreme Court is failing us these days. And I think it is a mistake for people to assume that what they're doing is merely interpreting the Constitution. That's far from what they're doing. Uh, they are, in fact, making it up as they go along, and they are doing some things in cases that have never been done before. So it's not that they are conservative in the sense of following precedent. Uh, they're conservative, perhaps, politically, but they are very activist in the role that they're playing. And this has been true of the court at other times, but this is one big hit after another, as it were. And a lot of it is about, uh, and Linda Greenhouse is very good about this, what you might call inside baseball. So you really have to be following what they're doing. Uh, the case that she talked about there was the Wisconsin election case, where they had a remarkable sentence, and she points it out. She says, she quotes, and there's no one who was willing to sign this majority opinion, this court has repeatedly emphasized that lower courts should ordinarily not alter the election. But she says, ordinarily? <laughs> what are you talking about? The reason for the dispute in Wisconsin was because of the pandemic. And that's why 180 polling places in Milwaukee were down to five. And why people were put to the choice of endangering their health and perhaps their lives or not voting because what the Supreme Court did was to impose a new restriction. You had to have it postmarked by a certain date, which had not been part of it at all. And 10 times as many requests came in for absentee ballots. And the court none, nevertheless said, oh, we can't process them, but you still have to have it postmarked. I mean, really impractical in the extreme. And really, I'm afraid, disclosing a kind of political approach that we haven't seen since Bush versus Gore. Um, and Bush versus Gore was pretty shocking at the time. The court itself said this is a precedent only for this day, as it were, a ticket for one day and one day only. Don't follow this. But now the court's not doing that. And Citizens United is another example where all of a sudden they departed from lots of precedent and said, oh, now corporations, nonprofits, labor unions uh, have First Amendment rights and we're going to run with that, which they've done. And they've done it in terms of the conscience that some kinds of corporations have if they object to a health care provision. Um, they've been really over and over again saying things that no court had said before and that are clearly not in the text of the Constitution. So this is an extreme activist court and people shouldn't be fooled by the label conservative. Well, Avi, I mean, you talk about a couple of things here and it, it sounds serious. It's beyond fragmented. It's like, you know, the, the plain meaning of the word ordinary. It, it, you, don't have to, you don't have to go to Yale and be on the law review and be the editor to know what the word ordinary means. Likewise, you don't have to have those kinds of credentials to understand what people out there in the community are thinking. All you have to do is read the newspaper and be a citizen of the times. So this sounds pretty serious. And my question to follow up with you is, um, is this a one-way street? Has this court completely abandoned, um, you know, the quality of law that we used to expect from the Supreme Court? Um, can we come back from this? Well, I think we can come back from this. Uh, and I don't know about um, completely. Uh, there are some cases where they still follow the law. But in these very significant cases, I think it's very concerning. Um, and, and there are things to be done. And it's not just to label them as Republican justices, which I think is a mistake. I think you have to look behind that label and say, it's not that they're Republican, it's that they don't have the respect for precedent 
that the court traditionally has had. And in the, the other article that uh, Linda Greenhouse wrote, she talked about uh, Justice Kavanaugh writing about stare decisis, about following precedent. And he wrote about it in a way, she called it 30 Ways to Leave Your Lover, that he uh, went through in a long essay. Simon and Garfunkel. <laughs> that he, he's setting a table to say, we don't have to follow precedent any longer. They've already been saying that in an alarming number of cases. And there are some big ones coming up uh, where it looks like they're kind of setting the table to say, oh, stare decisis following precedent. We don't have to do that. So Judge Kiramitsu, you know, uh, George Washington said in a letter way back when, the, the, the true administration of justice is the firmest pillar of good government. Um, can, can anybody um, skilled in the law or in public policy or simply who understands the nature of the country, uh, can anybody say that this is the true administration of justice? Yeah, you know, I, I think, um... To put this in proper context, um, Avi hit the nail on the head, and this is similar to what why Judge Jim Dannenberg, you know, resigned from the bo uh, Supreme Court bar uh, for the same reasons. You know, the Supreme United States Supreme Court right now has demonstrated, exhibited that they are way out of line. And they're very politically active. And we need to stop this. Now, obviously, we can't, we can't just walk right into the Supreme Court and say, you know, change your ways. Uh, but we have ways to voice our opinion. I think we need to follow the lead of Judge Dannenberg, amplify, expand why he resigned after 48 years as a member of that bar. And that's why we're here talking about it, because we need to find ways to preserve what Chuck Crumpton aptly described as the three I's, judicial independence, impartiality, and what's the third I, Chuck? Integrity. Integrity. Three I's. And we yeah. need to do that. And I, I have some proposed action plans that we need to embark on. But I think right now, Jay, we need to take action as best as we can and try to get the forces behind us so that the Supreme Court, the administration, especially pres the president, hears that there's strong resistance to this politically active United States Supreme Court, and we need to have this changed. You say uh, politically active, you know, I, I, people called Earl Warren an activist. Is, it the, is that the same use of the term? Uh, is yeah, you know, the, the activism of the Earl Warren court the same yeah. as the activism of, of, the, of the, rich, the, the John Roberts court? I think the word activist is in itself not um, negative. You can be politically active and still follow judicial precedent. Okay. Earl Warren's court, they were very liberal, but they respected the rule of the law, and they also respected judicial precedent, which the fancy people call it the star decisis. However, this United States Supreme Court is politically active in a negative way because they disrespect or just disregard the rule of law and disregard precedent, use precedent only to their politically active convenience. That's the big difference. Chuck, if, uh, if this keeps going, if we have more of this kind of case, more cases where you know, this, the rule of law is not respected, where the reality on the ground is not respected, what happens? What is the ghost of Christmas future? <laughs> <laughs> hey, Jay, my response is actually a question for Avi and Walter, and that is, what are the best avenues to not just stem this tide, but to actually turn the tide? Can state courts start to assert independent rulings and bases diverging from the Supreme Court? Can state governments start to establish their own directions and choices 
as Governor Newsom has done in California and the whole alliance of Western governors and Northeastern governors have begun to do, and now some Midwestern governors, can citizen groups and law groups form alliances? Can all four of these begin to form alliances to start to develop their own direction to affirm the rule of law, precedent, and conscientious, responsible decision making? What okay, are Avi, you, you have your question. And to me, that sounds like it is the ghost of Christmas future. A new kind of federalism. Talk about fragmentation. Uh, there you go. Can these United States work that way? Well, there was an occasion, of course, when they didn't. It was called the Civil War. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty tragic. Uh, and there's an additional tragedy, and this is not talked about much, but I think the additional tragedy is that right after the Civil War, Congress really wanted to do some things about racial discrimination. They understood what was going on in the South and the way in which former slaves were being kept in servitude in one way or another with violence and with private uh, depredations of all sorts. And they passed a bunch of statutes uh, between 1866 and 1875. The court then went about ba basically eviscerating those statutes. Some of them are still on the books uh, and can be used in civil rights and civil liberties cases. That's important, but the thrust of what Congress was trying to do has been forgotten because everyone wanted to sort of get back to normalcy, and normalcy in many ways was racism and was perhaps too much respect for the states. So there's a paradoxical irony in now saying, well, the hope may be in the states, and it may be. But state courts, as Chuck uh, in his rhetorical questions suggested, state courts certainly can do things. And in many cases, if they're careful, they will be immune from US Supreme Court review. Uh, it's not to say that if there's a real clash, if there is a, a tension between the federal constitution and the state constitution, that the state will win. But the states can say, we're basing this in the state constitution and going further in protecting rights than the US Supreme Court has gone. And that's well established that they can do that. What's, how's that going to happen? And I think Chuck ought to talk some about long ago and far away, the 1960s, and the role of the people as well as the courts. Chuck? Indeed, Chuck is a child of the 60s, even now. <laughs> <laughs> what, what is your answer to that? And could we have a situation <clears throat> where the state's courts rule, uh, the Supreme Court mm, you know, doesn't accept that, or doesn't believe it is consistent with earlier Supreme Court rules, rulings, and the state's courts ignore <laughs> the Supreme Court. Are we going there? Jay, I think that's a really great question because if you look at we, what we might learn from the 60s, what if people carefully and strategically chose their activities, their protests, their demonstrations, their voicings, so that if they were challenged, they would have to be state court challenges. So that the state courts could then affirm their citizens in expressing and asserting the rule of law in ways consistent with precedent. I think strategy is going to be absolutely critical in this because the other folks who have directed it away from equality, away from judicial independence, impartiality, and integrity. They have had a strategy for many decades, and it's working really well for them. Who could imagine that a guy like Mitch McConnell, a year before President Obama's term was up, could say, I'm going to shut down all federal judicial appointments, including Supreme Court, until we have a new election, just in case we might get one of our own in there. Well, to make it slightly worse, you know, what we have right now is he brought the Senate back uh, from some kind of recess due to the COVID crisis, not to work on the COVID crisis, but to confirm some judges and appointments. You know, what's wrong with this picture? Walter, we have a very serious problem going on here. And you mentioned earlier, I wouldn't want it to get lost, that you had some solutions you had some initiatives you wanted to talk about. What are they? Okay, well, you know, the, the, again, the main focus is to restore uh, 
the three I's, judicial independence, impartiality, and integrity, okay? Now, there are several fronts that we could uh, approach our response to the United States Supreme Court's political activity. The first front and the foremost front is to start with a small task force, okay? It doesn't have to be from Hawaii, but since we all in Hawaii, we're gonna start it in Hawaii. And that task force should have representatives who are concerned about this and who are willing to do something about it. Okay. Now, the fronts, the areas that we could address to resist and to change would be one, education. And this is where Avi and the law school come into play because to educate, to reemphasize judicial precedent, judicial integrity, independence, and so forth, to teach that and emphasize that and repeat that to our law students, that's educating for the next generation. We might, we might not be able to change this tomorrow or next month, but the graduates from the law school, when they have they're armed with it being educated of the importance of judicial independence and integrity and also stare decisis for precedent. They'll keep on repeating that, repeating that. And we need to go to the next level. We've already, I've already contacted the DOE, the public school education system, the social studies curriculum director, and see how can we integrate and emphasize the, the importance of judicial independence into our public education system. I also contacted the Hawaii um, Private Schools Association to see how we can, again, improve the curriculum so it will em emphasize the importance of judicial independence. No. That's one front of education. The second front is our voice. We need to express what Jim Dannenberg has expressed and take action that way and which representatives would be best to voice the resistance. We have a number of groups, um, the American Judicature Society, the American Board of Trial Advocates, American College of Trial Lawyers, the, our own Hawaii Bar Association. Some of them may not, may, may not want to step on anybody's foot. However, if we don't initiate it, nobody will do anything about it. So you have the education, the voice, and the third one is elections. Like Avi pointed out in the last program, we need to elect representatives, administration, leaders who believe in judicial independence, judicial precedent, and will, not, will, will emphasize and enforce that. The, the third, well, the next front would be voice, education, and um, uh, the, 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 the question of bringing, bringing the, yeah, voice, education, and the election. And the fourth front is, as Chuck mentioned, working with the state judiciary, okay? We need to maintain the quality of judges that we're fortunate to have in Hawaii. And that's largely due to this judicial selection process we have in Hawaii. We are, are able to select and nominate and appoint judges who are highly qualified and they've done a terrific job. So we need to again emphasize the continued surveillance or monitoring to make sure our judiciary from the state level believe in what we are talking about and they enforce it. We start at that level and go on to the Ninth Circuit and to the circuit court level and then go on to the United States Supreme Court eventually. So those are the funds that we have. We have a lot of work to do, but one of my colleagues emphasized, and this I, uh, uh, I really believe in, she said, I think this movement that we're talking about is one of the most important crusades of my lifetime. That's how important it is. It really 
it, it, it's really a prominent issue. Oh, I totally agree. Issue. Yeah. You know, you know, one one uh, element you didn't mention, Walter, is 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 the media to make a campaign oh, yes. in the media. And exactly. um, you know, my, my brother Gene and a fellow named Scott Harshbarger, who used to be the Attorney General of Massachusetts, are involved in something called L LDAP, uh, Lawyers for a Defense of American Democracy, LDAP. Um, but you know, they haven't gotten that far and it takes a lot of effort, a lot of time, and maybe, you know, uh, years of work um, before you actually make a, an impression on, on a whole society. And uh, I think the most, you know, the most immediate thing in terms of making the point uh, is the judiciary to find good judges who will focus on independence. But also, Avi, and I wanted to ask you about what is the role of the law school? Because law schools haven't necessarily gone this direction. But how could you get mm, legal training in Hawaii uh, to adopt and, and uh, you know, incorporate uh, Walter's initiative? Well, the law school in Hawaii is where you should do it, of course, the yeah. William Richardson School of Law. And uh, I think we have a wonderful blend of support for students. Students actually like law school, which was not my experience and is not the experience of many, if not most lawyers. Uh, and they support each other. We're the most diverse or certainly one of the most diverse law schools in the country. So you learn something about how important it is to remember where you came from, but also it's important to be open to learning from others. And that's true in terms of food and music, but it's also true in terms of the way you think about the law. And there are many different ways to think about the law. The old idea of think like a lawyer, there's not just one way that a lawyer thinks. And there are many different kinds of lawyers, of course. But I think what goes on in legal education is development of critical thinking. That's really true uh, and very important, as well as involvement as citizens. Uh, so even if you don't become a lawyer, and some people come to our law school to be leaders, as C.J. Richardson used to talk about, not even thinking that they want to practice law, they wind up being leaders. And they're leaders on the grassroots level of committees and uh, task forces and so on. But also a lot of them are involved, of course, in the political world, the judicial world. And so uh, I think law school is a place where we, our bread and butter is kind of looking at what judges do, critiquing what judges do. And for all that I've just said critical things about the US Supreme Court, at least they try to explain what they're doing. They write opinions, perhaps hiding behind a court decision that isn't <laughs> done by any justice like the one we were talking about before, but they try to explain themselves. And so our job is often to say, wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense, or here's another precedent that goes the other way. And so that's a very important thing that we do. And compared to the legislature, that is our Congress and the executive, uh, it's sort of straight talk uh, within the parameters of what judicial opinions look like. And so it's open there for everyone to read and to criticize. So Avi, is it time to be more strident about this? Uh, not only the law schools, but the legal community uh, to say in, in the words of the network movie, I'm mad as hell and I'm not gonna take it anymore. And, and I'm seriously going to go out and advocate for this, and I'm not taking no for an answer. Is it, is it time for a strident kind of response? Well, I think it is increasingly a, a time for strident response, but strident response brings strident response to the response, right? So um, people were talking about the Michigan protesters, about open up Michigan. Uh, and Chuck and I uh, talked about this a little. And, and in fact, they do have a right, probably, to protest. And unfortunately, they have a right to open carry. So they, I think that's really stupid, wrongheaded, all the bad things one could say. But I gather in Michigan, you're allowed to run around with a semi-automatic rifle. So they're within their rights. Now, they're not within their rights if they're within six feet of each other. And the governor said, you shouldn't be within six feet of each other. So stridency, I think, is not the only way to go. But Chuck, I think we'll talk about some of the, the people in the streets of the 1960s where it really did move government, it seems to me. Yeah, Chuck, let's go to you. We're almost out of time. And, uh, you know, what about that? And what about the, the Hawaii State Bar Association, too? Can you fold that in somehow? I, I think Avi and Walter have hit exactly on the heart of the matter, that the rule of law at its best, especially now in a trauma crisis besieged society, is collective, it's collaborative, 
and it is conscientious, combining the independence, the impartiality, and the integrity. It's not, the rule of law is not divisive. It's not elitist. It's not destructive of the institutions and the values that our society depends on and that connect us as people. If the rule of law really comes out as we are in this together, exactly as Walter's examples have laid out a path for, and exactly as Avi's values and principles have laid out a path for, that is our best hope. We can do this together because then the people who face elections, the people who face appointments will have to pay attention because their safety, their security will depend on some measure of consensus with our movement. Well, you know what? Uh, you've started something, Walter. Don't stop your, your list of things in this discussion. It's very important. It has to be continued and repeated. And we have to bring other people in on it. And to hear on a given Tuesday morning is not enough. We have to reschedule. We have to go forward. Right now, we're out of time. Thank you, Avi Stoyford. Thank you, Chuck Crumpton. Thank you, Walter Kiramitsu. We'll do it again. Stay by. Stay Thank tuned. You, Thank, Thank you, you, Jay, for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you all for the discussion. Awesome. Uh -huh.